What's up, everybody? My name is Godzi, and welcome back to another episode of Umineko When They Cry Answers Arc. Last episode, Kinzo told us more about how he met Beatrice, as well as how he managed to get the gold. And it was just this big old gunfight, and the only people who survived were Kinzo and Beatrice, which was something I actually predicted would happen before it happened. But it doesn't make it any less cool, so woohoo! Uh, don't have any comments to read since this is all pre recorded. So, yeah, let's just get back into this. I think I've learned just how much the woman called Beatrice influenced Grandfather's life. We haven't learned anything. Who killed Beatrice? Unless we figure that out, we'll never be able to get out of here. You're right. We need to finish this quickly. The funeral is already over, after all. I'm gonna be honest. Uh, well, not honest. I'm gonna take a big guess here. Uh, with this whole who killed Beatrice thing. I might have said this earlier. I don't remember if I did. Uh, but obviously, I think at this point, they're not referring to, uh, Beatrice Castiglione. And they're also not referring to the Beatrice who Rosa met, who was at the Cuadorian and died. Because... Be Beatrice Castiglione died during childbirth, and Beatrice at the Cuadorian fell and died, so no one killed either of them. So I'm assuming it's going to refer to, uh, I'm gonna take a hot guess here, Shannon Cannon and Beatrice, since they're the same person. I guess that means there's a third human Beatrice then, which is crazy. Uh, I'm gonna assume that's who it's referring to. And, uh, there's gonna be a murder game, and I guess that means the culprit won't be Shannon Can and Beatrice, because Batler isn't here. So, there's gonna be a different culprit, which is interesting. I wonder who it could be. I hope it's not just Eva. Because if it's just fucking Eva, that's gonna be boring. And if it is still Shannon Cannon and Beatrice, that's also boring. Uh, but, whatever. Assuming Shannon Cannon and Beatrice is even the murderer in games 1 through 5, which is... Definitely something I could prove, I'd assume. I don't think there's anything in particular that'd be difficult to prove there, but either way, yeah. You've got it all wrong. This is the funeral. You mean, what she's making us do? All of the Beatrices we've heard about so far weren't killed at all. We're trying to understand where the word killed factors in. That's the real funeral, as far as Burncastle's concerned. No one knows about her being killed, and that's the truth we're trying to expose. You're pretty sharp, aren't you? Hardly feels like I'm talking to a piece from the lower plane. So this is why I was given you as my Watson. <laughs> Ouch! Don't call your partner a piece. So what next, Willard Holmes? <laughs> Step one of holding an investigation is questioning witnesses, of course. There's still a Beatrice we need to ask about. Okay. Uh, still one they need to ask about. Is he going to ask about the witch Beatrice, then? To indicate whom they should talk to next, Will nodded in the direction of George, Jessica, and Maria. Maria seemed to be lecturing the others about something. Wow, Beatrice sounds pretty incredible. Yeah! And then, inside an upside-down cup, she made tons of candies appear out of nowhere! Inside the overturned cup? Amazing! Sounds like magic to me. Maria really does love witches and magic. We could hardly avoid consulting our local authority on witches. When looking for someone to ask about Beatrice, Maria rose to the top of the list. The Beatrice she spoke of wasn't the real Beatrice, the one Kinzo and the others had talked about. However, here and now, on the Rokanjima of 1986, the name Beatrice probably refers to the person Maria's always talking about. I don't see Battler anywhere. Ushiromiya Battler, the one who was forced to fight as Beatrice's opponent in many games, and the most important person in this game, this tale. A Battler in this world would probably be the Peace version, but even so, it should be possible to get some vital information out of him. Will probably wanted to talk with Batler too, but he was nowhere to be seen in the cousin's group. Batler did not attend this funeral. It's a shame seeing as he's the cousin closest in age to me. 
Are you two on good terms? Yes, of course. And you pinch his butt every time he says something perverted. Oh, how did you know? Did your detective instincts tell you that? <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> Burncastle said that everything we needed was gathered here. Since Bower isn't here, that probably means it's possible to find out everything without asking for his side of the story. Or maybe she's intentionally hiding the core elements and making us take the long way around, as part of some fickle witch's game. Since he isn't here, that probably means there's no need to hear his story for the time being. Let's talk to Maria and the others. I won't say anything perverted, so keep your hands off my ass. <laughs> then why not try choosing your words a bit more carefully? With a roguish smile, Leon pinched the air. Index finger against middle. Ah, it's our successor! Are you done babysitting the old geezer? Gah! <laughs> then Leon just fucking knocks her out. At least Leon was impartial. No mercy, even for Jessica. Will felt a bit gratified. I see. Since you're the successor in Krause's child, then Jessica is your little sister. He was so used to Jessica being an only child that, though the scuffle between the two looked perfectly natural, something didn't feel quite right about it. Jessica, can't you talk a bit more like a little sister's supposed to? And while we're at it, why not try talking more like a girl your age? How many times do I have to tell you to stop calling me successor? Shut up! I live the way I want to! I'd suffocate if I had to act all refined like you, successor! <laughs> Ouch! Ow! Stop it! Don't pinch me! This is little sister abuse. Pervert. Stop it! Ow! <laughs> Jessica, why are you talking like that in front of a guest? Do you want mother to scold you again? Oh, oh god! <laughs> you won't get away that easily. <laughs> I get the feeling that Leon and Natsu here probably... Well, I guess they're mother's son, but... Yeah, they probably get along well, don't they? They seem to act very similar, except Leon's a little more goofy. Looks like those two are close in their own special way. Well, Leon is an excellent person to be the successor without any faults. I guess I understand how Jessica feels. Leon might be a bit too perfect sometimes. She gets compared to Leon no matter what she does, and that makes her made her rebel. If Jessica had been born an only child, I'm sure she would have become a composed, quiet young lady. <laughs> nope! <laughs> That's an interesting thought. Don't worry. That wouldn't be enough to change her personality. George, who is this person? This is the first time we've met, right? But you seem to know a lot about our family. I'm George, and this here is Maria. Pleased to meet you. Call me Will. I'm investigating Beatrice. Please tell me what you know. Oh boy. Okay, I didn't know if she was going to go crazy or be happy. <laughs> Beatrice? Oh, see? Beatrice exists! Oh! <laughs> Though Maria had looked hostile towards the unfamiliar man, as soon as she heard the name of the witch she loved pass his lips, her eyes began to sparkle. Hey, Maria, you've got to greet our guest properly. Hello, my name is Ichiromi Maria. Oh, I'm glad to meet someone who knows Beatrice. Handshake! Ew! <sighs> Maria suddenly stuck out her small hand, and Will reached out for it reflexively. <laughs> as soon as he did, he felt a bright light seeping out from the gap between their hands. Oh yeah, that again. The theater-going power that Burncastle had given him had affected Maria. Beatrice is a witch of Kanjima. She plays with me every time I come here. She's my best friend and a fellow member of Mariad Sorcier. Ew! The light grew brighter and brighter. This time he could feel himself being drawn into Maria's world. I wonder if actually Shannon can and Beatrice, like, Maria's like the only one who knows the Beatrice side of those, well, that person. <laughs> That's probably the case. Because otherwise I don't think she'd be so fucking adamant about it. Because it's not like she goes on and on about like Santa. Maybe around Christmas, but it's October always in this game. Also, okay. <laughs> I'm Ushiromiya Maria. My mama is Rosa. My papa, I don't have a papa. 
I just fucking spawned here. I think I remember Mama showing me a picture long ago and saying, This is your papa. It was a picture of a man with a dark suntan on a beach wearing a swimsuit. What if her dad's Okanogi? Later on, when I learned what Papa meant, I asked Mama to show me that picture again, but she said it didn't exist. Oh. But it had to have existed. When I drew a picture of it and showed it to Mama, she got really mad and said it didn't exist. Or that if it did, she had already thrown it away. Ever since then, she kept saying that I didn't have a Papa. Hmm. Did you know? People say you need a Papa and a Mama to have a baby, but that's a lie. Virgin birth, is it? Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. If I was a boy, that might have been my name. <laughs> That's actually a good point. What other crazy ass, well, crazy ass for Japanese standards names could have been in this game, just like, and this, like, <laughs> fucking Eva has a second son, and she's just like, these are my children, George and Mark. Just <laughs> That does not make sense in a Japanese visual novel, but... Hey, whatever. It was just Kinzo's obsession with Western names, and it just went through the fucking family. Book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 20. Now, verse 23. Verse 20 is, But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. It's weird to use such a high-pitched voice to recite... Bible? Bible? It, religious something? I, I don't know a lot about religious texts. I don't even know if that is a religious text. So your father is the Holy Ghost. Aaron said that everyone has a papa. They said it was strange to not have a papa, that I was a weird, pitiful child. But when I asked Mama, she said I didn't have a papa, that he didn't exist. She got mad and hit me, even though all I did was ask. <laughs> so I didn't really understand who gave birth to me. I was an immature and misplaced creature, not a proper human. I realized I was a strange, pitiful girl, different from everyone else. It doesn't matter who your parents are or what other people say. You are who you are. Thanks, Kasha. It must have been hard to teach that to a young, immature kid. My kindergarten teacher might have said that to me when I cried after being bullied. But even those words of encouragement couldn't fill the blank space. Now, the questions. Those words can answer the questions in my mind. And the book is what gave you the answers. A priest came to see me. A priest. It was probably part of some lesson to enrich the minds of children through an edifying tale. To most of the children, it was just an ordinary fairy tale they might have heard from one of their teachers. Actually, I think we were just bored because it was too hard to grasp. Then at the end, the priest said something important. That God knows everything. Yep. So I asked him. I only have a mama. I don't have a papa. Mama gave birth to me without a papa. Was that a strange, sad thing? I asked. The priest taught me. There's nothing strange about a child having no papa. After all, Jesus Christ was born of a virgin. And the one who gave birth to him was the Virgin Maria. Virgin Mary, but I guess... I was surprised. Maria, the name I was given, had been showing me the answer all along. Hmm. I was so shocked I asked the priest to say it again. He said that the Virgin Maria gave birth to a baby by herself. Is it just interchangeable between M Mary and Maria then? So I asked him if that meant I could give birth to a baby all by myself too. And how do you answer that? He said the Virgin Maria was with child because of the Holy Ghost. The second part of the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 20. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. That surprised me again! What do you think that means? You interpreted this to mean that Ushiromiya Maria had no human father. That your real father was the Holy Ghost. This has nothing to do with Beatrice. Why am I going along with this? Regardless of the Bible's original meaning, okay, it was the Bible, this young, sad girl, whose lack of a father had caused her to lose her sense of identity, had finally created a way to understand herself. Once I realized that, I knew I was different from all the other kids. The ones who made fun of me were all children of Joseph. But I alone was different. I wasn't worse than everyone else. I was a child of God, a child of the Holy Ghost. When I got back, I told Mama. 
I had no papa. Mama gave birth to me thanks to the power of God. You keep telling yourself that. It was probably painful for Rosa when Maria asked about her father. Why did Maria have no papa when everyone else had a papa and a mama? Every time she was asked this, Rosa flew into a rage and changed the subject. As she do. Then, for some reason and all, of, all on her own, Maria had found an answer that satisfied her. She had no papa, she was the child of mama and god. It isn't too difficult to imagine that Rosa, after hearing this young girl's explanation, might go along with it as though it were true. Basil said that the minimum number of people needed to create a world is two. I thought she meant that you need two parents to create a child. That's when I thought of it. Beato may be a witch, but she's a witch born of a human. Beato isn't a child of the Holy Ghost. But I'm different. I was born from Mama alone. I was born of the Holy Ghost. Beato can't create a universe without me. But God is always by your side. I can make a universe all by myself, along with the Holy Ghost. Beato called me the Witch of Origins. And she also said that eventually I might become a creator who could create anything alone. Okay, I see the parallel then. All by myself, I can create something out of nothing. Banto can take that and extend it into infinity. Angie was the witch's apostle, who would spread the word far and wide. And that was Mario de Sorcier. There's a huge difference between one and infinity. That's why Banto is so great. However, compared to the difference between existence and non-existence, one and infinity are nearly the same thing. I'm the child destined to become the best, best witch. Now... The greatest creator in the world! Mariage Sorcier was the nest to prepare me for that. I am Ushiro Mia Maria. Maria, who stands by God's side. Well, there was a little bit about Beatrice in there. If we liken Maria's sense of identity to a universe, then this endless stream of words coming from her might be like the Big Bang. She spent so long tormented over how to interpret her lack of a father. Then, by chance, she saw a line in the Bible that looked like it secretly referred to her, and she finally formed an understanding for herself. The sad girl, who had hated herself for being different from all of her classmates, finally found a meaning for her existence. At that moment, Maria's universe, which had once been nothingness, was born as a clump of ultra-hot, ultra-high-pressured energy. Then, later on, she went to Rokanjima, met the endless witch who called herself Beatrice, and the clump of energy exploded in a big bang, giving birth to their magical compendium. That was the universe known as Mariage Sorcier. Hmm. We're jumping about a bit too fast. Let's take things one at a time. Sure! Where do you want to start? After you decided that you were the child of the Holy Ghost, it's easy to imagine that you gradually became more and more interested in the occult. And then what? Once you reached that state, where did you meet Beatrice? And how did the two of you interact? I'm glad Willard is a lot kinder than Erica was. Like, obviously I don't think, like, Willard's gonna become a fucking antagonist. I don't think that's the case at all. But it's like, it's such a breath of fresh air that Erica's gone. <laughs> like, it's not like I hated Erica. But, basically, Erica's whole character was, Fuck you, this is the truth. I don't care what you say. This is the truth. Oh, you had a PBJ sandwich? Hmm, no you didn't. It was peanut butter and banana. Your dumbass just didn't understand it. It was like, ugh, Erica got old. <laughs> Especially her battle with Maria. It was just so fucking petty, and it really just kind of showed how much of a dickhead she is. But Willard, on the other hand here, is kind. Like, not kind by choice, but kind in the fact that he's like, I don't really care about messing with people's realities, I just want to know what I want to know. Which is much more commendable. Or respectable. It really did happen all of a sudden, one day. I wanted to meet the witch called Beatrice, who lived on Rokanjima. I wanted to meet her as a fellow witch. And that time you already knew you were a witch. I did. Even then, when it came to the Bible and the occult, I already knew as much as an adult. So, even though I couldn't use magic, I believed that I was a witch. <laughs> it's a bit funny, isn't it? That's why I was only a witch apprentice. When did you meet Beatrice? I don't really remember when. But I do remember what it was like. 
It was really, really sudden. Shannon was just standing there. I turned around and then I turned around again and whoop de doo there she is. Huh? <laughs> so, you are Ushiromiya Maria, I presume? It was so very sudden. I was just drinking some milk tea all alone in the Rose Garden Arbor. Mama said she had to talk about something important with Uncle Kraus, so she told me to go outside and play. Suddenly, she was sitting right there. I didn't know anyone who spoke that way. I quickly realized that she was someone I didn't know at all. Who are you? You're the one who wanted us to meet. Here I am, welcoming the witch who came to visit my island. And yet you ask my name? <laughs> Be Beatrice. Precisely, I am Beatrice. Now yeah, that is pretty sudden. Yep, really, really sudden. There are witches and spirits right next to us all the time. They just choose not to show themselves. And when they do show themselves, it's always sudden, as though they've been there the whole time. So that's what I learned that day. And then, you and Beatrice became friends. Yeah! She stayed and chatted with me the whole time, until Mama was done with her work. We talked about magic and witches, and about how I was a child of the Holy Ghost. And what was your impression of Beatrice, then? I don't like saying it, but my knowledge at least was better than hers back then. At first I thought she wasn't a very good witch. Well, that was just my conceit. There are so many different kinds of magical compendiums, plus mine was based on self-study. I probably only viewed Beatrice that way because her magical compendium was different from mine. It wasn't long before I came to regret that and apologized. Apologized? Did Beatrice do something to win your respect? I see. So, she showed you magic. Oh. This must be the point where, uh, she showed her the cup candy trick. We moved to the beach and talked lots, sitting at a table under an umbrella. Very interesting. Maria, I see you have been quite diligent in your studies. At your age, to be capable of teaching a thousand-year-old witch such as myself is truly an accomplishment worthy of admiration. So, what sort of magic can you use? Magic? If you call yourself a witch, you must be able to show me some sort of magic, correct? I was stunned for a second. Of course, it should have been obvious. I was a child of the Holy Ghost, and since I'd studied so much of the occult, I was also a witch, not a human. Until that day, I'd been so sure of both of those things. So when I was asked what sort of magic I could use, it left me in a daze. When one knows of magic and can speak of it, they finally reach the rank of apprentice. One is only a witch if they can put such knowledge into practice and use magic, correct? So, I'm not a witch yet? You've studied well, and I can sense a very rare talent within you. One day you may become a witch so great that even I cannot compare. Or perhaps even a creator, as you have told me. However, you are still young and immature. You are, yes, you are an apprentice. A witch apprentice, you might call it. So does that mean you can use magic, Beato? Of course. I could not call myself a witch otherwise. Incredible. Show me. I want to see your magic. Until this day, Maria had never doubted the magic-themed idea that she was the child of the Holy Ghost. I think I just thought of something. Even if I'm wrong about, like, Shannon Cannon and Beatrice being, like... First off, the same person, and second off, the culprit. I think somebody has to have a second personality as Beatrice, at least. My reason for that is, Batler saw Beatrice at the end of the first game, and his perspective is objective, right? So, uh, hmm. At the very least, there is a human Beatrice that does indeed exist. Not to mention, there's all the testimony in the second episode with, uh... Like, Kyrie, she said she saw a human Beatrice. If, did Rosa say it too? I don't remember. There was someone else who said it, but I forget who. But either way, yeah, that must be the case. Plus, Maria, she always testifies that Beatrice exists. However, no one ever had, had ever proven to her that occult phenomena actually existed. Maria could create a universe all by herself. However, she wanted to share it with a second person, so that she could believe in it even more strongly. Once, I could have drawn a rainbow in the sky, 
transformed it into seven colors of candy, and eaten them at my leisure. However, my power is weakened so much that I cannot even preserve my form to my satisfaction. You told me about that. You can't use your full power because of the shrine. It will take quite some time before my power returns. At this moment, I cannot turn rainbows to candy. What does the shrine actually have to do with anything, though? Like, from a magical perspective, it makes perfect sense, but from a perspective in reality, I cannot put my finger on what that has to do with anything. Like, just for the fucking story of Beatrice? Like, if that mirror is broken, then it makes sense that Beatrice can do her whole ritualistic ceremony and kill everybody on the island? Is that what its purpose is, or is there some other thing? Because a, a mirror obviously cannot seal a person's... a witch's magical powers if witches don't truly exist and magic doesn't truly exist. The shrine's an anomaly, but the only thing I can think of is, as I already said, breaking it could help perpetuate the story of Beatrice. So, yeah. <laughs> It will take quite some time before my power returns. At this moment, I cannot turn rainbows to candy. However, perhaps I can show you a bit of that power with some simpler magic. I wanna see! I wanna see your magic! Very well. However, I must ask for your assistance. As I have already told you, no matter how pure your soul might be, all humans are tainted and filled with the toxin that resists magic. Yeah, I remember. You told me about the anti-magic toxin. It wasn't in any of the books I've read. You must really be incredible to know so much. Beatrice lifted up an empty teacup, then turned it around in front of Maria to show that there weren't any tricks or strings. Right, the magic to make candy appear inside an overturned cup. How do you know? You're incredible, Will. You even know about witch magic. It's the most basic sort of witch magic, after all. That's a new expression. It was just a normal cup without any tricks in it. I wanted to see, I wanted to see true magic. There was a thing Maria desired to strengthen her belief that there was an occult side to her. She wanted to see the occult outside herself as well. That's why she agreed to help Beatrice with her magic. She didn't want her own toxin to ruin her chance of learning the miracles of magic. Good. Then, try looking inside that cup. Ah! There's candy! There's candy! As a gift to mark my meeting with a new witch, and as a sign of our friendship, I offer this to you. This was a true miracle of magic. For the first time, I felt shame and embarrassment at my conceit. I could feel that sense of Im omnipotence disappear. The idea that I was the child of the Holy Ghost and the most important and special person in the world. Instead of a child of the Holy Ghost who can't actually do anything, I'd rather be a witch who can use magic. Ushiromiya Maria wants to become a witch, starting off as a witch apprentice. I was already fascinated by Beato. I want to become a real witch too! I want to be your disciple! How modest! You already have an abundance of talents and diligence. Also, though it may have been different when I was at my full power, I cannot take on a disciple in my current state. So I can't become a witch's disciple? Correct. You cannot become my disciple. However, you can become my friend. Really? Indeed. From this point forth, we shall be friends. Let us continue to discuss the deep and profound world of witches. Oh! Thank you, Vieto! Can I eat this candy? No, let that be a souvenir. Instead of eating it, keep it in that adorable bag of yours. Okay, I'll eat it at home. Oh, oh, oh. Maria, that candy was brought into being by my magic. Therefore, it is fragile. If you deny my existence with that toxin of yours, it will melt and fade away. Eh, no. I want Beato's precious magic to disappear. Then be sure that you do not forget your meeting with me. As long as you keep a little promise with me, I shall be here to greet you when you return to this island. Oh, I'll keep it! What's the promise? Well, to start, when you get home, wash your hands. Then, rinse out your mouth. You must not complain about this, for it is an important part of a witch's apprentice's trading. I'll do it! 
Every day when I come home, I'll wash my hands. I'll rinse out my mouth. If I do that, will I see you again? I promise it. If you keep your end of the promise, your body will be cleansed and I will gain even more of my magical power. If that happens, I will show you even more incredible magic the next time you come. I see. Okay, um... I was about to ask, why the fuck would Beatrice be telling Maria to wash her hands and rinse out her mouth for no real reason? But is this also to perpetuate the story of Beatrice? Ew, I'll keep my promise, no matter what. I'll do it. I'll become your friend and a witch apprentice. Your resolve is heartening, Ushira Mia Maria. I hope you will grow to become a full witch and my close friend soon. Hmm. Well, that was interesting. I think that was the first time I met Beatrice. And was that candy still there when you got home? Yep. But I doubted a little, so it was all melty. <laughs> I regretted almost doubting her. Well, that's a different reason. It melted because of this thing called heat. But, okay. If I doubted her more, the candy would have disappeared completely. I almost lost the proof of the magical miracle that happened before my eyes. A piece of candy melted. I think it was more of a caramel than a normal candy. It was all lumpy, just starting to melt. Now what time of the year did this happen? I'm not too sure, but I remember that the milk tea had ice in it. Why does that matter? <laughs> Never mind. Did you tell Rosa about your meeting with Beatrice? Yep. I told everyone about it at dinner that day. Uncle Krause laughed at me. Then Mama, who was sitting next to me, got mad and told me to stop talking about it. Yeah. Next to you? By your family's ranking system, your seat shouldn't be next to Rosa's. It wasn't a family conference. It was just when Mama and I came to visit. So it was only Uncle Krause's family, Mama, and me. There were fewer people, so we didn't sit in the same spots as a family conference. And Rosa was sitting in the seat next to you. Yeah. Why does that matter? Do they still sit by rank technically? Like, regardless of anything? So, the way they'd be seated w should be that, like... It should be Kinzo, Krause is second, Rosa is third, then... Or would Leon be third? So then Rosa 4th, Jessica 5th, Maria 6th, and then Natsuhi 7th, right? Have you ever met with Beatrice outside Rokunjima? I'd imagine Leon- well, Leon would be either 2nd or 3rd if he's the successor, you know? No! After all, Banto's body is fragile, so she can't go wherever she wants. Instead, I wouldn't mind letting her possess me, but she said she couldn't because she couldn't leave the island. And after that, you met her every time you came to Rokunjima. Yeah, we became really good friends. The more I talked to Beatelle, the more I realized what an amazing witch she was. She showed me wonderful magic every time I saw her. Then, she told me about a magical compendium that was different from mine. And we both talked together about the mysteries of magic. I wanted to reach her level as soon as I could. I wanted to become the kind of witch Beatelle was. Did you ever introduce Beatelle, Beatrice to your mother? Nope. She said Mama's toxin was too strong, so they couldn't meet each other yet. Almost all adults are no good when it comes to the toxin. Because they're all tainted. <laughs> was anyone other than you able to see Beatrice? They couldn't at first. She said her magical power was weak, so her body would crumble if even a little bit of the toxin reached her. But she got her magical power bit by bit, and she could eventually appear in front of other people who had small amounts of toxin. And who was that? Hmm, there weren't many of them, just a few of the servants. Ah, uh, specifically? All the servants here today. Eh? But not Gota, I think. I was about to say, Gota? So there were four of them. Genji, Shannon, Cannon, and Kumasawa. And Dr. Nanjo, too. Huh. Okay, hmm. So I'm gonna guess, then, from what that means... The reason why she could, well, Beatrice, so Shannon Cannon and Beatrice, assuming they're the same person and also the culprit, 
Would that mean Genji? Because I already suspected Genji and Nanja were accomplices for the culprit in all five games. Because I feel like, first off, if Nanja wasn't an accomplice at all, that would make a lot of the crimes impossible. Like, for example, the closed room ring. If Shannon, Cannon, and Beatrice are the same person, then that would mean Shannon and Cannon were faking their deaths in the closed room ring. Nanja was with the group that was, uh, checking the bodies, I'm pretty sure. If Nanja wasn't an accomplice, he'd just be like, Oh, well, uh, Shannon's not dead. So, yeah, that means Nanja has to be an accomplice if Shannon, Cannon, and Beatrice are the same person and also the culprit. And I only suspected Genji as well, because Genji is another one of the, uh, s servants with the one-winged eagle on their clothing, and also considered Kinzo's furniture. Plus, there's the parallel with Ronove. So then, does that mean Kumasawa was also an accomplice? Because... If Kumasawa is an accomplice, then that would explain a couple things, I believe. Like, not many things, but it would explain the garden shed in Chapter 4. Even though, I I honestly thought for the longest time George is an accomplice. At least in some of the games. Like, I, I thought George was an accomplice in the third and fourth games, at least. Because that's... George being an accomplice in the fourth game was the only way I could fucking explain the gardening shed, but if Kumasawa was an accomplice, then George throwing in the key, Kumasawa could have just thrown it back out. So, yeah. And that would, I think, would also explain, uh, the fight between Beatrice and Virgilia in the third game. Because it could be Kumasawa was a accomplice, assuming, oh, I'm not gonna die, that doesn't make sense, I won't die. And then she, and then Beatrice, Shannon Cannon, just walks up to Kumasawa, just like, Sorry, you're gonna be one of the first ones dead. And she's like, what the fuck, no! And she, like, fought back, I guess. Which is what uh, Beatrice and Virgilius' fight was supposed to mean. I guess that would explain it. I don't think Kumasawa is necessarily necessary to be an accomplice. I feel like, even without her being an accomplice, everything can be explained, except for that battle and the gardening shed in the fourth game even though George can easily explain that and the battle between Virgilia and Beatrice can easily just be passed off as bullshit because I don't think every single time that a supernatural character is on screen are they necessarily meant to represent somebody so in that case does that mean Gap also represents somebody I was thinking Gap might be able to represent Eva but I don't know. Or maybe, like, Gap doesn't seem to have a clear parallel with anybody. I only say Eva because Gap, like, fights with her legs and so does Eva. Eva's trained in martial arts and the like. But it's possible Gap just represents that there are other accomplices that are, like, different between each game. I think that could be the case. Because I think Eva and Hideyoshi have to be accomplices in the first game. Rosa potentially in the second. And then in, like, I guess Kumasawa would still have to be, but George could have still been one in, like, the third game, I suppose. But, whatever, let's just continue. Apparently, they would sometimes come to visit Maria and Beatrice's witch tea parties. Of course, they had only come by for minor things, like bringing some more tea. However, they were certainly aware of Beatrice and even talked with her. Interesting. But wait, this would mean Maria has seen Shannon and Cannon talk to Beatrice, right? Or not necessarily? How'd the servants react to Beatrice? She was a guest who shouldn't have existed. Weren't they surprised? Of course not. After all, Beatrice is the other master of the mansion. She said that the servants treated Beatrice as an honored guest. And sometimes they were permitted to witness new miracles of magic along with Maria. So on the Rokunjima of 1986... The ones who could actually meet with Beatrice were you, Nanjo, and the four servants excluding Gota, for a total of six. Yeah, Banto said she'd need to store up much more magical power before she could appear in front of anyone else. 
so she intended to show herself in front of more people sometime in the future. Yep. She said the day she made all of the humans acknowledge her would be the day of her resurrection. Hmm. That's interesting. Maria, the servants, and Nanjo had acknowledged her. She had probably appeared before new humans one by one, starting with those whose anti-magic -to toxin was weakest. Beatrice's game was to increase the number of humans who could recognize her, until she could make everyone on the island acknowledge her. Of that, there can be no doubt. In that case, the last person Beatrice needed to appear, f appear in front of would be Batler, the one said to have the strongest anti-magical power. Does this mean Beatrice thought B Batler would be the hardest to convince? It seems true that Batler was one of Beatrice's goals. However, if we go with that chessboard thinking Batler loves so much, Beatrice is trying to make people acknowledge her existence. Therefore, you might say that she's a character who can't exist unless people acknowledge her. Batler reached this idea himself as soon as the first game. Yes, there's something different about the Beatrice of 1986. She's different from the Italian Beatrice or the Kuadorian Beatrice, both of whom certainly did exist. The Beatrice of 1986, the one we're so familiar with in a mysterious way, yet who has no existence. What does it mean to kill this Beatrice who has no existence? The minimum number of people required to create a universe is two. However, Maria said that even a single person could give birth to a universe. And yet Maria desired a second person. A second person to nurture the world she had given birth to alone. Because if it was born and not nurtured, it would die and disappear? Let's replace the word universe with Beatrice. You know, I was about to say something like that. The word universe is interesting. I never really understood what it meant, but it could mean, like, personalities. Like, it takes two people to create a universe, so it takes two people to create a person. However, if it takes only one person to create another person, then that's an alternate personality. So, I'm thinking, does that mean Maria and MARIA, all caps MARIA, are, like, same person, obviously, but also different personalities? Or at least to some extent, different personalities. Because it's like, you have regular Maria, but then she has like a tick. Like, you start talking about witches or magic and denying it, and she just goes, hee hee hee, all of a sudden. So, and something else I think I've noticed, come to think of it. Regular Maria, so Maria, when she's not talking about witches, always goes, ooh, ooh, ooh. But when she starts talking about witches, she goes kee hee hee and never goes ooh ooh ooh. So I'm thinking that might mean Maria and all caps Maria, the witch Maria, are alternate personalities as well. Obviously, that doesn't really have any bearing on the number of people on Rokanjima. I, we were never told these are separate people, but we were also never told that these are the same personality or the same persona in any sense of the word. Because it could be that Maria, regular Maria, ooh, 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 Maria. We'll just call them ooh, Maria and Kihi Maria, all right? So, ooh, Maria learned all this stuff about the Holy Ghost and stuff like that, and how she doesn't have a papa, or a father, however you want to say that. So, that quote-unquote realization led to her quote-unquote giving birth to the Kihihi Maria persona. And I think we could also do the same thing with Eva, right? It might have something to do with, like, Beatrice herself and the Legend of the Gold. Like, Eva. So you have Eva and then you have Eva Beatrice. So there's Eva and then there's, like, Eva Beatrice. I'm not saying, like, oh, everyone has alternate personalities, but there are certainly other people who are kind of at least two-faced. Because, like, if Shannon Cannon and Beatrice are the same person, which at this point I'm 100% convinced they are, Maria and Maria are different personalities. Eva and Eva Beatrice are different personalities. I'm not going to go into this for fucking everybody. 
like Jessica and Jessica when she was trying to kill Kyrie. I'm not saying those are different people. Like, seriously, as far as we know, it's always been a magical perspective whenever Jessica or George went fucking crazy. So as far as we know, those parts of their personality don't even exist. Like, as far as we're aware, there is no unbreakable resolve George and no fucking iron hammers of hell Jessica, for lack of any better terms than that. Like, it could, it could just be a fucking magical personification of their determination to be with the one they love. That could certainly be the case, because those sides of them have only ever come out whenever it came to their love for Shannon or their love for Cannon. So, yeah, that's interesting to think about. Like, Rosa, for example. I, I don't think Rosa necessarily has two personalities. I think she's just a pretty fucked up person. Like, I'm not saying she's an awful, terrible person, but she sure ain't a great one. So, yeah, I, I think I've kind of run my point into the ground by that point. I'm not sure it, how right that is. I'm not sure how much it matters whether I'm right or not in that case. Like, whether or not Maria and Maria are different personalities, they're still the same person. And it really doesn't matter if they're different personalities, but it might just be more exposition for how this stuff works. Same with Eva and Eva Beatrice. So, yeah. Let's replace the word universe with Beatrice. The minimum number of people required to create Beatrice is two. However, even a single person could give birth to her. And yet that single person desired a second person. A second person to acknowledge the Beatrice created by the first person. That meeting with the second person is the scene Maria has just described. The single person who created Beatrice looked for a second person to acknowledge Beatrice, and selected Maria. We don't need Furuto Erika's heartless reasoning to know that the teacup magic was a sleight of hand. Maria, believing in the story about the anti-magic toxin, would close her eyes whenever magic happened. Any sleight of hand would be possible while she had her eyes closed. The caramel Maria had been given as proof of her meeting with a witch had melted a little because Maria had doubted. In a season where one was likely to put ice in their tea, it was only natural for a caramel left in a bag to melt. Ujiromiya Maria, the girl who's too trusting and will accept the story easily. Beatrice appeared first in front of this girl, who had in the language of witches, very little of the anti-magic toxin. The creation of Beatrice can be thought of as an egg being laid. When a single person creates her, it's little more than a daydream. She's still inside the egg. If and only if a second person acknowledges her, the shell will crack and she'll appear. So only appear if a second person comes to warm the egg. When Maria acknowledged Beatrice, she finally hatched, and the chick was born. In that case, Mariage Sorciere, which nurtured Beatrice and her magical compendium, was like a nest. This is Beatrice, a woman with a dignified presence, who calls herself the Witch of Rokanjima and who claims to have lived a thousand years. That sounds less like the chick Beato, who appeared in the previous game, and more like Beato the Elder. So did the meeting Maria has just recounted mark the birth of Beato the Elder? The egg itself had already been created by the first person. Between then and the meeting with Maria, it matured immensely inside its shell into a character with the dignified presence of a thousand years. Then, when Maria acknowledged it, it hatched, and the Witch of Rokanjima finally gained a form. Perhaps that moment marks the birth of the Beatrice of 1986. The younger chick Beata was born out of love for Batler. Since that birth hasn't yet occurred at this point in time, the birth of Beato the Elder and the existence of Beatrice at this moment must have nothing to do with Batler. Hmm. Are you enjoying this reasoning, Burncastle? If you are, let's at least have some applause from the spectators. Tch. Great, thanks a bunch. I wish for Beato to grant me a lot of things with magic. That's why I'm helping her with her resurrection. What is it you wished for? Lots and lots. <laughs> Not telling. 
So you wanted to protect your mama from the Black Witch. How'd you know that? You're incredible! Eh. Uh. Okay, she seems to like seamlessly go from ooh to kee hee hee. And you're already sure that you'll never be able to get that world back without a witch's help. Yep. I love mama. She's so nice. I want to be with her forever. For all eternity. Now I'd like to hear about Mariad Sorcier. Hmm. What's wrong? Don't wanna. Huh? I'm thirsty, so I'm gonna go get something to drink. See you later. Maria became suddenly formal, bowed her head, and left without waiting for a reply. It was a very un-Maria-like thing to do. I see. So, the Game Master has moved the piece. Apparently, she's telling me to ask about something different. At some point, Leon had started chatting with the other family members. Jessica seemed to be getting irritated at having her butt pinched so much, and George was trying to calm her down. Leon is an anomaly. Jessica and George. Guess I'll hear their stories next. Compared to, the Mar to Maria, the anti-magic toxin is very strong in these two. At least at the beginning of the other games, they didn't acknowledge Beatrice. Maria showed me the point of view of one who believes. Now to hear from those who don't. Oh. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I kind of like the way this is set up so far. Even if no one ends up dying this chapter, that's not the hook of Umineko, obviously. The hook is like this whole overarching story in the first place. It's like how everything connects. What matters and how does it matter? Well, what matters is a pretty easy question. Fucking everything. But either way, I think we're going to end this episode here. So that's going to be it for this episode, guys. If you liked it, be sure to press the like button. And if you didn't like it, then fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi, and I will see you all next time. Goodbye!